How's your heart tonight? I don't mean have you been for an ECG. <laughs> you sick of ECGs. I've had ECGs, heart x-rays, blood <laughs> tests of uh, various kinds in hospital, trying to uh, discover what was wrong with my heart and of course COVID basically. Mm. Why would it be racing at more than double its usual rate? Why does it still go very fast, very slow, very fast, very slow, as if somebody's playing a symphony with it? They can't find the answer. But it's not that heart I'm talking about tonight when I ask you, how's your heart? I'm talking about deep within your soul, the part of us that God calls our heart, where actually we respond to God and relate to God from the depths of our being. It's of this heart that Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus is here pictured, like in that famous painting, knocking at the door, but it's not a door to a house or a cottage. It's the door to your heart. It's the door also to mine. But can you hear him knocking on the door? One little girl said to the pastor, Oh, pastor, I can feel him knocking. The pastor had to explain, No, that's your heartbeat, love. <laughs> but you will feel him, and you can feel him knocking. Yeah. When he's knocking at the door of your heart, inwardly you know he is asking for you to let him in. And so our first word tonight is going to be four simple words. Hope you can remember them. And if you can't, well... John does our uh, videos and puts them on YouTube and Facebook every week for people who can't make it uh, to watch. It's a very important ministry and we're grateful to John for doing that. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. What must we do? We must admit him. Now the word admit can mean different things, can't it, in the English language? Uh, you can admit when you were wrong. But this word, admit, means to let someone in. You admit them to your house. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. Will you let him in? In fact, we need to open the door to Jesus, who is the only door to God. He said himself, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. But as he comes knocking on the door of our hearts, and remember these words of Jesus were spoken to Christians. This isn't a message only for those who do not yet know the Lord. This is a message for those who do know the Lord. As Jesus comes knocking on the door of your heart, does he find it locked? So often Jesus will find a locked door. Hence he's knocking. If the door was wide open with a big sign on it saying, Jesus, you're welcome, come right in, I don't suppose he would need to knock. He's knocking because the door is locked. And the Bible gives us the exhortation again and again to unlock and open the door of our hearts to God. In fact, Paul sees his ministry in these terms in 2 Corinthians 5. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading with you through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I can implore you from the scripture tonight, will you open your heart? Please open your heart to the Lord. Don't let there be a locked door between you and Jesus. The church in Laodicea had shut the door. Then they'd locked the door. I don't know if they'd even put the chain on by now. And Jesus is knocking outside. Please, my people, will you let me in? The door can be locked in several ways. It can be closed because of sin. Do you remember how Adam and Eve, walking in the garden, well, God came down, didn't he, in the garden of Eden, and he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And it says in Genesis 3.8, on one occasion when God came down to walk in the garden, Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Why was that? It was because sin had entered their life experience. So now they had shut and locked the door. Of course they didn't have a physical door to hide behind, so they hid in the bushes. From God. And friends, sin in our lives will produce a locked door between us and our Saviour. 
and we must open the door by letting go of sin, confessing our sins that we might find forgiveness and cleansing, and the door is open again. We must never allow sin to build up in our Christian lives and say, oh well, it was only a little sin, God will forgive me. Well, have you, have you gone to him? Have you spoken with him? And have you got the assurance that that sin is dealt with and God has forgiven you? And remember, as the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And, this is the important bit I want to emphasize, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's one thing to be forgiven, but the picture of confession and forgiveness in the New Testament is not confess, forgive, do it again. Confess, forgive, do it again. It's confess, forgive, and be cleansed, and then you won't want to do it again. That's what uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 promises. If we confess our sins, he will forgive our sins. We need that. That opens the door to God. But then he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness that we do not then shut the door again on our relationship with God. Sin is the first way in which we as God's children may shut our hearts to him. There is another related way, of course, and that is by hardening our hearts. Romans 2.5 warns that in accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath on the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That was written particularly to those who did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But the principle, as a principle, is repeated in Hebrews to those who are Christians. Where it says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It's so easy, friends, to harden our hearts because sin leads us to harden them. But as we hear his voice, if we are hearing him knocking at the door, wanting to come in, then we should get to the door quick. Have you got a delivery driver like that? Mm. You've got to get to the door quick. The, the door quick. Mm. Otherwise you leave it on the step and go, no matter if it's raining or not. <coughs> Jesus isn't impatient. But because of who he is, friends, when we hear his voice, let's not harden our hearts. Let's run to open the door. Mind you ladies, don't fall over as you're running. <laughs> to open the door to the delivery driver. But get straight to Jesus when he's knocking on the door of your heart. And you know, he will knock on the door of our hearts at all times through our Christian experience, throughout it, from the time we were born again, and some of us maybe were born again as children, but until our old age. And I've got people here tonight who might possibly describe themselves as old. If you're over a certain age, you can count yourself as old. And I'll leave you to pick what age. All right? But it won't stop. I've been walking with God for 60 years, one man said. Praise God, brother. He's still knocking at the door of your heart. And he's saying, will you let me in? It's an ongoing relationship. You know, if your friend came round to your house every day of the week for 40 years and the door was always open and uh, he came in and made himself a cup of tea and sat down with you, what would happen after 40 years if, if uh, the next day he came and, and the door was locked? He'd have to knock, wouldn't he? I don't know what caused, you know, perhaps the wind had blown the door shut. Perhaps you'd forgotten he was coming round and uh, you'd neglected to open the door. But then he would have to knock. And my point is simply this. Jesus Christ will continuously be imploring his people that we should open our hearts to him. It's not something that just happens when we're born again. It's not something that just happens after a, a period of backsliding. It's something we need Jesus to remind us of every day. My son, my daughter, give me your heart. Open your heart to me. Do not harden your hearts as the children of Israel did in the wilderness. For you saw what happened to them, God said. They hardened their hearts they went astray, and I swore to them in my wrath, they will never enter my rest. There's another way in which the door of the heart can be closed. I, I've just picked one really, but I suppose there are many related um, sins in our hearts. Not the sins that we do outwardly, but the sins inside, which cause that inner door to be closed. 
One of them is selfishness. When Paul wrote to encourage the Philippian church, he said this, and it's quite a telling statement, it's quite an indictment on the ministers that Paul knew. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all men seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Out of all the fellow labourers and all the ministers that Paul knew in the New Testament church, he had one of whom he could say, I can send him to you, he won't be selfish. It won't be about him. When he comes, it won't be all about him. It will be about the Lord Jesus Christ. He will genuinely have a care for your welfare, meaning your relationship with the Lord. And are you going on with him? That's what he was talking about. And it's striking how selfish us humans are able to be. And it slams the door shut on Almighty God. We could talk about our pride. But perhaps we'll get to that. Pride slams the door shut to Jesus. Friends, let's open our hearts. Jesus said, whoever does open the door, I will come into him and dine with him. And he with me. As many as received him, when we first opened our hearts to Jesus, we knew this to be true. As many as received him, he gave them the power or the right to be the sons of God. They have the right to be sons of God, friends, because they are sons of God. They're born of God. When you ask Jesus into your heart, you're born again. Born of God. Even to them that believe on his name. By putting our faith in Jesus, inviting him into our hearts, we are born from above. We have an open door between us and God. Let's keep it open. We need to admit Christ. Have you admitted Christ into your life today? Is he welcome inside right now? Here's a second word for you. This follows straight after. To allow Jesus in, we must first hear him knocking and open the door, but then Jesus says, I will come in. Coming into our lives, Jesus Christ is Lord. He won't come into our lives to be our friend unless he is first our Lord. He won't come into our lives to be our saviour unless he is first admitted as Lord. No one is saved who does not own Jesus as Lord of their lives. It's a fake gospel that tells you you can believe on Jesus and be saved. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Meaning, our faith in the saving person of Jesus presupposes our submission to him as Lord. Will you take him as your Lord? Will you submit to his lordship? The Bible says, submit yourselves to God. And that, if we're submitted to God, it fills us with spiritual power. For the next verse says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. I wouldn't try resisting the devil if I were you, unless you were first submitted unto God. Well, you'll have a right kick in the teeth. And there are many, as Paul wrote about Timothy, there are many, even in ministry today, who fail to recognize the principle of submission to the will of God. There are many self-called evangelists in the church today. self called apostles, self-called pastors in the church of Jesus Christ. There's no room for them. There never has been. They shouldn't be there, but they're everywhere. The, the words of the Bible are clear, and the example of Jesus is there for us to follow. As he prays in the garden of Gethsemane, O oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Friends, that should be the response of our hearts as we let Jesus in. We're saying, Lord, it's not my will anymore. It's your will be done. I'm letting you in to surrender myself to your Lordship. Do you know if you're not surrendered to Christ's Lordship tonight, the door of your heart is <laughs> locked down, bolted to him, and he's outside knocking to get in. That's the picture here. That's what he's saying. 
That's what he wants us to take from this verse, Revelation 3.20. Hmm. Not my way, Lord, but your way. Do you remember, I'm sure you do remember, the life story of the Apostle Peter, Simon Peter? Well, he's there because he's one of us, he's an ordinary fella. He gets it wrong time and time again. But as he goes on his journey through life with Jesus, he's learning. He's very eager to learn from his mistakes. And boy, he makes a lot of them. He must have learned a lot. But he did. Because in his mistakes, he learned to surrender to Jesus. In fact, so much so, that on that resurrection uh, day, that, that, that period of 40 days when Jesus showed himself alive to his disciples. There was one day when, you remember, Simon Peter was out fishing with some of the, some of the lads. And they saw <coughs> Jesus on the beach. G Peter couldn't get to shore fast enough. He didn't wait for them to row the boat. He jumped in and swam. He got ashore. And when Jesus has a conversation with him, he says these words. Most assuredly, I tell you, when you were younger, you girded yourself. And you walked where you wished. When you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he said to signify by what death Peter would glorify God. In other words, Simon, when you were young, you did what you wanted. But I have a way, a plan, a purpose in your life. And you know what, Peter? It isn't going to be what you want. It isn't going to be what you think. It's not going to be glory, glory, glory on the way to heaven. There's going to be suffering for you, my servant. There's going to be death on a cross. And Peter was crucified. Jesus had forewarned him of this in John chapter 21. Now, none of us have been crucified, literally. And yet the scripture says that we have been crucified together with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. Christ lives in me. And Peter had to learn as he went along in his relationship with Jesus. Friends, we have to learn as we go along. And I, I can well remember my teenage years when I first came to know the Lord and how the Lord taught me. And elders, uh, Pentecostal elders in the church would remark and say, well, brother, you know, the, the Lord is taking you through, through something hard. Um, he's going to do a, a quick work. He wouldn't let you go through this Gethsemane unless you're going to come out and serve the Lord. But something I learned there in my experience is this. If we want to serve the Lord, friends, it has to be his will. I can't stand up in a meeting, put my hand up and say, Brother, I want to be an evangelist. I give myself to the Lord to be an evangelist. I put my hand up and say, Lord, I, I, I uh, surrender myself to be an apostle. No, I can just surrender to his will, whatever it is. And most of the time, believe you me, you won't like it. Not to start with. Because it will cut against human pride. It will cut against human self-will. Because Jesus can't use you unless you're surrendered. He can't use me unless we are surrendered. And he's got to do what he did with Peter. And break the stubborn self-will before we can be used. You can be as talented as you like. You can be as clever or as rich as you like. The Lord can't use you or I till we find surrender. Remember how Peter was so full of himself. Lord, though everyone else denies you, I never will. And then with that little girl recognising him at the fire, he denied his Lord. He went outside. It broke him to the core. Believe you me, he wept bitterly. And he learned that he couldn't ever follow the Lord in his own way or in his own strength. But he would follow the Lord as broken now as he was, in the strength of the Lord and in the way of the Lord. In fact, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered <coughs> by the Lord. And he delights in his way. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths. Are you letting the Lord direct your life? Your ministry, your service, full surrender is what Christ calls for. I uh, do recall um, we've had, in time past, we've had many missionaries pass through the church. 
and uh, sometimes if you have a new missionary you have to test their calling. Or I, I've actually had um, young people come to me in the church claiming to be apostles. And according to the book of Revelation, I have to test their calling. And it becomes very apparent to me when I meet someone who is not, whose life is not given over to God and surrender to do his will. There's something faulty with their calling. And they never last. They never last. But if they have been broken to be blessed, if they have come to a point of surrender, then they will continue in that ministry as long as the Lord puts them there. Because they will go through and through with Jesus. Not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, writes Paul in Galatians 2. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. As Jesus knocks the door and we admit him, he will come in and we must submit to his rule. And then he says, whoever opens the door, I will come into him, I will dine with him and he with me. This speaks of commitment. We must commit our ways to the Lord. He with me is the key phrase there. Jesus is saying, he, you, with me. Now think of those words for a moment. You with me. That's a commitment. That's a lifelong commitment. It's the commitment we made when we knelt at the cross of Calvary and gave our lives to Jesus that we might be saved. We were making a commitment, and we can't pretend we weren't, that all our life long we would follow and serve him. Our baptism is also an open public confession that we've died to the old life and we're alive now to live for the one who died and rose for us. We live for Jesus. We are committed to the Lord. And friends, we must be committed so that we will always be with him. Now think of what that means. Always with him, on his side, on his team, if you like. One of his friends. We're not going to give up, we're not going to forsake him. We have to commit our lives into his hands. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, the scripture says, and lean not to your own understanding. We have to leave with God the things we don't understand. Why is this happening to me, Lord? Why are you asking? Commit your way to Him. It has to be your way, Lord. And as I take my way, I don't always know your way, Lord. I don't have in my diary a perfect plan of what God would do in my life every day. I don't know what the future holds, but I have to commit my way to the Lord. Psalm 37, 5. Commit your way to the Lord and trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. So many are running around today trying to bring things to pass. Uh, we've all been numbered among them at different times. But there's a way in which we have to leave things in God's hands so that He might bring it to pass. I've even seen in the realm of divine healing, people hastening and rushing, and they'll rush from here to there to get prayed for by everybody. And they'll question their own faith, and they'll question the faith of the evangelist, and wonder why they're not healed. Commit your way to the Lord, so that He will bring it to pass. You see, it has to be His way, it has to be His time, it has to be His plan. Otherwise, it's just self-help and self-effort. Don't be deceived into thinking that faith is some kind of self-help gimmick. That you can just have faith, and as a result, do whatever you like. Get whatever you need. Faith is trusting God to act. And our commitment is surrendering <coughs> our wills to Him, that He may act in the way and time that He so chooses. Now you often hear preachers talking like that who don't believe in divine healing. Hands up tonight if you've received healing from Jesus. Many times. Many times. But I tell you what, I've learned over the years with some serious healings, really serious healings, it was his time. It was his way. 
I'd exhausted all avenues. I prayed till I was blue. Got anointed with oil. Went to this preacher, that preacher. Got prayed for. Listen, but the Lord did it. The Lord did it. And he will answer your prayer to heal you in his time. We must commit our life to him. We must commit our way to him. But also, friends, we need to commit our work to him. This is important. I believe we're a church. We're a privileged church here in Pontypool. We're a very small church. But we're privileged in a way. I don't look at the congregation and see a load of happy, smiley faces all the time. I don't look out... Not tonight, anyway. Um, I don't look out on the congregation and see a bunch of perfect people. But I'll tell you what I do see. I see everyone in the church in one way or another wanting to do something for the Lord. I do see that. Be it ever so minor, it's for the Lord. And we have that. We are working for Jesus. I'm sure we all wish we could do more. And if the Lord has challenged your heart as he's knocking on the door of your heart to surrender to him and commit your way to him, it must be because he wants you to commit your work to him. Commit your works unto the Lord, says Proverbs 16.3, and your thoughts shall be established. If you've got a plan, something you want to do for Jesus, you know what you should do with it? You should take it to the Lord. I've been pastoring now for three decades and I've been working in a dozen churches, not as full-time pastor, but I've helped out here and there. Uh, and they look to me, uh, you know, do the pastoral role or the priest's role uh, in some churches. And um, I, I find it's a common thing across churches. People look at what's happening in the church and they say, don't like that. People even choose churches on that basis. They go to a church and say, mm, yeah, I don't like what this church is doing. Um, I think I'll go to another church. I've never got my head around these people. But God knows them. God bless them. That, that's their way. If you've got something in your heart that you want God to do, if you've got something in your heart you want to see in his church, don't criticise your brother sat next to you. Don't criticise the pastor, whatever you do, because you'll bring judgment on yourself, as the Bible warns. Instead, take your desire to the Lord where it should be taken. And he will work it out in your life for you to fulfil that ministry that he's calling you to. Friends, some people are sat in the pews for so long because they don't appreciate this simple reality. He's the master. He's the Lord. When you've got something on your heart, take it to him. Commit your work to him. If it's from him, listen to this word. I've quoted it already. Proverbs 16.3. He will bring it to pass. And all the evangelistic activity we've done in the past, it's come from the Lord. we brought it to the Lord. We've got up to do it. And it's happened. <coughs> Never a word has fallen to the ground. Not so far. Don't rest on your laurels. You end up like Samson. Yeah, if we think that everything we do turns to gold... We might be like Samson. He didn't realize his strength had gone from him. The Lord had left him because he'd left his consecration to the Lord. Whatever you do for the Lord, commit it to him. And one final point. Now, have you got these simple words tonight? I made them very simple. Admit. Let him in. Submit. Let him be Lord. Commit. It's his way. How about transmit? Transmit. I've been thinking very much about the preaching of the gospel uh, this weekend, Paul told Timothy, I remember Ray Hunston reading this at my induction many years ago, preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. And the Great Commission is recorded in several of the Gospels. Mark's version says this, go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptised shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. I did wonder tonight whether to bring a message on evangelism. I will at some point. Do you know what motivates our hearts? As we transmit the gospel, we preach the word because we are concerned that people should be saved. And we are concerned that people should not be damned. 
And that should motivate us, friends. As we have opened the door, as we have let Jesus in, as we eat with him and he with us, we have his presence. And that presence is key to our going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. Jesus says, lo, I am with you always. As you go, if you're sat at home not going any time, and you're wondering why he hasn't gone with you, it's because you haven't gone. Putting that in the context of, once again, doing his will. We need, friends, to share the good news, because evangelism is incarnational. Christ living in us, reaching out to others. And how we fail in this, how we fail in this, I'm speaking to us as believers, we all fail in this quite miserably. It simply means we need to be like Jesus for others. He has kindness. He has love. He has patience. Mm -hmm. He was always able to give a cheery word to his disciples. Cheer up, he said, I've overcome the world. In a day when everyone is moaning and groaning... And uh, even in our own Christian conversations, we can look on the dark side of everything. We need more Christians willing to be like Jesus in our midst. Lifting us up, not putting us down. Shining as lights for Jesus that will draw others to him. Let your light so shine before men, he says, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Or they might be opponents of the gospel. They might not believe in God at all. But let their mouths be shut if they've got anything to say and point the finger at the church. Let them come and have a good look at the church if they like. Let them have a good look at the people. Let them have a look at how we live our lives. And let us hope that we are living in such a way with Jesus in our hearts that it shuts up the harshest critic of the gospel. We are to <coughs> preach the word, but we are to live the life. We are to be... And I'll close with this, 2 Corinthians 3, 2. We are to be living epistles, written on our hearts, known and read by all men. Will you accept the challenge tonight? I just feel it's important that we remind ourselves and remind each other, open the door of your heart. We focus on so many programs. Shall we do this in the church? Shall we do that in the church? Whoa, 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 wait. Wait a minute, there's a basic thing here, and if you miss the basic here, do whatever you like, it won't work. Open your heart, give me your heart, and then, as we work for the Lord, we commit our way to Him. He will bring it to pass. Amen. Amen.